which you deceive me, I want to invite you to go ahead and take it out. Go over into the Gospel of Matthew, to Matthew, the 28th chapter. I want to read the last three verses of this chapter here at Jackson Heights. These are three verses that we really like to keep on the forefront of our minds as the people of God. We really want to emphasize these verses here at Jackson Heights. So in Matthew 28, in verse 18, Jesus saith these words, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded to the end of the age. As you allow those verses to kind of just soak in your heart for just a few moments, I want to begin my study tonight by telling you a story about a woman I met while doing local work in Florida named Helen. I want to tell you about Helen. You see, Helen was invited to one of our services by one of our new converts. Her name is Nicole. Nicole invited Helen to services one day. And after coming a couple of times, I decided to pull Helen aside and ask her if she would mind having some Bible studies with me. I asked her if she wouldn't mind if I sat down with her and shared some things with her from the gospel. And thankfully, she, she took me up on that offer. She gave me that opportunity. And so for several weeks, we, we had some Bible studies. And I got to tell you, for the first few weeks of that, of that study, things were going very well. We studied about Jesus. And we studied about Bible authority, and we studied about the, the three promises to Abraham. And if you know, I love to, uh, to study that. And we studied about worship, and we studied about the church, and we studied about, about baptism. We studied about a lot of different things in, in our Bible studies. We also studied about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We also spent some time reading from Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. You see, due to some information that she had given me about her current marriage. That was a study we had to have. That was a study we needed to have if she was going to be able to have an opportunity to have a real walk with Jesus. And so one night, Helen, myself, Janicia, and Shawn Michael, when he was like one, we came together and we studied this issue. I had Helen open up her Bible and read from Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. She read where Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse number 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality marries another, commits adultery. Helen read those words from Jesus for the first time in her life. And brothers and sisters, I kid you not, when she read those verses for the first time in her life, I can remember after Helen read the words of Jesus in that verse, she stood up. She slammed her Bible on the table. She shouted. She screamed. She cried. She asked the question of, why did God even put that in the Bible? But we never saw her again. That's Mary. Mary, and I was not the issue. Okay, based on but I don't like that. And I'm not going to do that. That's exactly what. You tonight, has that like that ever happened before? In a situation where you see someone, or maybe you they refuse to talk anymore, has that ever happened before? Come to try to win lost souls for Jesus Christ. Have you ever faced the obstacle of rejection? You ever faced rejection? You ever have somebody turn you away? You ever have somebody tell you no when you were trying to show them something from the Bible? Let me tell you something. If you're someone who is serious about fulfilling those verses we just read, if you're someone who is serious about fulfilling the Great Commission and trying to win lost souls for Jesus Christ, if that describes you tonight, then there is no that you faced that before. If you are serious about trying to win souls, there is no doubt that in your life you have faced rejection. And when faced with rejection, let me ask you, brothers and sisters, how did you react to that? How did you respond to that rejection? Were you disappointed? I was disappointed on both of those occasions. Were you frustrated? Oh, I was also frustrated on both of those occasions. Were you also angry? Were you embarrassed? 
Were you shocked? Were you discouraged to the point that you never again wanted to want to try to do any kind of evangelism? Does, does that describe you? I ask you that last question because it occurs to me that that is often the response that a lot of disciples have to rejection. You see, for a lot of disciples, they will allow the devil to use a couple of instances of rejection to discourage them to the point to where they no longer want to try to fulfill the Great Commission. Unfortunately, they'll allow, they'll allow the devil to use a couple of cases of rejection to allow them to, to no longer want to go out and try to win lost souls for Jesus Christ. For a lot of disciples, they allow rejection to hinder their efforts to win the lost. And so because of that, because this obstacle, the obstacle of rejection, is one of the greatest tools the devil has in his bag. I think we need to know how to combat it effectively, don't you? I think that's something we need to talk about. As the people of God, we need to know how to properly deal with the obstacle of rejection. In fact, I want to suggest to you tonight that when it comes to overcoming this terrible obstacle, God wants us to always remember at least three things. And here's the first thing right here. The first thing we got to remember, if we're going to overcome the obstacle of rejection, is number one, we got to remember that this is not a new obstacle. This is not a new challenge. This is not a new problem. Brothers and sisters, for thousands of years, way before our time, way before we even came into this world, the people of God have been dealing with this problem. For thousands and thousands of years, the people of God have been dealing with people who did not want to obey the truth. People who did not want to do what Jesus says. The people of God have been dealing with this for a very long time. And i got to tell you, that bit of information is shocking for a lot of disciples to realize. We find that there are a lot of success stories in the Bible. You know, one that immediately comes to my mind is the story of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah? We remember after spending three days in the belly of a fish, Jonah finally decided to obey God and go and preach to the people of Nineveh. The Bible says that Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and he told the people to repent. He told the people to turn from their wicked ways. He says that they didn't do that. And in 40 days, God was going to bring them down. In 40 days, God was going to bring judgment on them. That's what Jonah told the people of Nineveh. And after doing that, after telling these enemies of Israel this bit of news, do you remember how those people responded? Do you remember in Jonah chapter 3, beginning verse number 5, the Bible says that after hearing the preaching of Jonah, the whole city of Nineveh repented. They fasted, they turned from their wicked ways, they decided to surrender to the Lord. Jonah preached the word of God, and a whole city repented. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good success story, wouldn't you agree? I mean, I wouldn't know how to act if I went through Columbia and preached, and everybody in Columbia responded to the gospel with obedience. I may do ten backflips if something like that happened. Jonah preached the gospel and a whole city repented. That's a pretty successful story. But you know, it doesn't stop there. Because we go to Acts chapter 2 and we read about what Peter did. Remember, Peter on, on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem preached a sermon about Jesus. Told people that Jesus was both the Lord and the Christ and they had killed him. And after preaching that one sermon, the Bible says about 3,000 people repented of their sins and they were baptized into Christ. After hearing one sermon, 3,000 people got baptized. Can you imagine seeing something like that? I mean, this morning we were happy to see one baptism and we should be. But can you imagine seeing 3,000 people get baptized in this baptistry? That would be an amazing thing, wouldn't it? One sermon, 3,000 people obey the gospel, but it doesn't stop there because you go to Acts chapter 4, and just, and just two chapters later, the Bible says the church at that time had grown to 5,000 men. Now, the word men there in that verse is not being used generically. That's being used to talk about adult males. That's not counting the women and the young people who were old enough to obey the gospel. There are at least 5,000 males in the church by the time you get to Acts chapter 4. And then you go to Acts chapter 8 and you can read about three different conversion stories or successful conversion stories. There's the story of the conversion of the Samaritans. There's the story of the conversion of a sorcerer. 
a, a, a magician named Simon. There's also the story of an Ethiopian treasurer who was on his way back to Ethiopia, and Philip, the preacher, studied the Word of God with him, and he surrendered to the Lord by being baptized. Three stories, three successful stories in Acts chapter 8, and then you go to Acts chapter 9. And you may find the most radical conversion story in all the Bible, the conversion of a, of a persecutor of the church, Saul. Saul turned away from persecuting the church to being a faithful Christian, to being a faithful gospel preacher. And then you go to Acts chapter 10, and there you see that Cornelius and his whole household obeyed the gospel after hearing it preached by, by Peter. And then you move on to Acts chapter 16, and there you read about the conversion of Lydia. And you read about the conversion of the Philippian jailer and his household. And then you go to Acts chapter 17, there's the conversion of the Thessalonians and also the conversion of the Bereans. And then in Acts chapter 18, there's the conversion of the Corinthians. In Acts chapter 19, there's the conversion of the Ephesians. I mean, all of these examples I just showed you are successful conversion stories. In every one of these cases, all of the people responded to the gospel in the same way. They responded with humble submission. They, they responded by believing in Jesus, surrendering to his will, and being baptized. Now, that's just a sampling, just a sampling of these successful conversion stories. And, and you know, after considering these stories, we might be tempted to think that that's the way it was all the time in, in the Bible. We might be tempted to think that in the first century, they must just had it easier than what we have today in the 21st century. We might be quick to think that in that time, every time a disciple went out preaching the gospel, people responded. People always responded with obedience. We might be quick to think that. And if we did, brothers and sisters, we would be wrong. We would be just dead wrong. You see, we've got to understand that for every successful conversion story you find in the Bible, you got about two or three more that were not so successful. And can I give you some examples of those? I'm reminded, first of all, of the story of Noah. Y'all remember Noah? You know, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, says something interesting about Noah. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness. That means that in addition to building that ark that we talk so much about, Noah also preached the word of God. He also told people to repent, to get ready for the judgment of God that was coming. Noah preached that for maybe about a hundred years. For about a hundred years while preparing that ark, he also preached the word of God. And do you remember how after that time went by, after Noah finally finished the ark, do you remember how many people... Responded to his message positively. It was seven. After preaching for about a hundred years, only he, his wife, their three sons, and their three daughter-in-laws got on, the, on that ark. I have no telling how many people in the world at that time, only seven people responded to Noah's message. That's not very good. Only seven. But you put that with what you find with the prophets. You know, with the exception of Jonah, the story of the prophets is a story of rejection. Throughout the Old Testament, we find men like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Micah and Hosea and Amos and Joel and Habakkuk. All the prophets went out preaching the word of God. They went out telling people to repent and be devoted to God. And for the most part, all the people of Israel rejected them. They didn't obey the things they were saying. In fact, on many occasions, the people got angry with them. The people shunned them. The people persecuted them. They threw them in jail, and they even killed them. The prophets went through that. And, and so did the apostles. The apostles went through it also. You know, I just gave you a few examples of some successful conversion stories in the book of Acts. But let me give you some that were not so successful. I'm reminded of Acts chapter 4 and how Peter and John were thrown in jail because they preached about Jesus. Because they told people he was the Lord, he was the Christ, and he had been raised from the dead. In Acts chapter 4, two apostles were thrown in jail. And then in Acts chapter 5, all of them are thrown in jail. All of them are thrown in jail, this time for the same reason, for telling people about Jesus, for telling people he had been raised from the dead. And then you go to Acts chapter 7, and you find a Christian, a preacher, and a deacon in the church named Stephen. 
who went out telling the people of Israel that they had a bad history of rejecting God. He preached about their stiff necks, and after preaching that, they stoned him to death. He was stoned by the Sanhedrin Council. And then you go to Acts chapter 14, and you can read about how when Paul went to Lystra, some Jews beat him, they stoned him, and they drug him out of the city, leaving him to die. That happened to Paul when he went to Lystra, and when he went to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, the Bible says he had to quickly leave that city because he was facing a lot of opposition to his preaching. And then in Acts chapter 19, if you remember, a riot broke out in the city of Ephesus because, again, the apostle Paul was preaching the word of God. He was talking about there only being one God, and that got in the way of some idle craftsmen making their money. He was getting in the way of people. A lot of people said, and they preached. So happened to the Jesus. Do you think that everybody everybody responded? John chapter. And John the sixth, in just a second, but he, when he told the Jews on this occasion, or live forever, they would have the blessings he had to offer. They would have to center their lives around him. Same people who that he miraculously multiplied food again as many. They would. I want you to know the greatest preacher to ever walk to you. In fact, on this occasion, because of our challenge, the Bible says that hundreds and hundreds of people left Jesus on this occasion. Hundreds of people no longer walk with him. That's what the scripture says. And let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this. If people rejected the truth, after hearing it proclaimed from the very Son of God, if people rejected the truth after hearing it proclaimed from a perfect preacher, what do you think they're going to do to us? I mean, really. Do we really think we can teach the gospel any better than Jesus? Do you really think that? Do we really think we can teach the gospel better than Paul or Peter? I hope we don't think that because it's not true. What I just want you to see is this challenge of rejection we're facing today, it's not a new challenge. And say it is a challenge, it is a painful reality that the people of God have been experiencing for thousands and thousands of years. Brothers and sisters, we're not the only ones, we're not the first ones to wrestle with this problem. This is a very, this is a problem that goes back a very long time. And so can we, let's remember that when we go out preaching the gospel. Let's remember, we're not the first ones to deal with this problem. But secondly, let's also remember who people are really rejecting when they reject the gospel. You see, we got to understand that when we show someone something from the Bible, and they reject that teaching, they refuse to do what it says, we need to always remember they're not really rejecting us. Do you know who they're rejecting? They're really rejecting God. They're really rejecting Jesus. They're really rejecting the Holy Spirit. And the reason I say that is because the source of this book, the source of this gospel that we're going out to preach to the world, it does not originate with us. It does not originate with our minds. Instead, it originates from the mind of God. It originates from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul says the Scriptures don't come from men, they come from God. And then you put that in what you find in John chapter 16. This is something that Jesus wanted the apostles to understand. In John the 16th chapter, look at verse number 12. In John chapter 16 and verse number 12, this is what Jesus said to the apostles before being crucified. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But, but when He, the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will guide you into all the truth. 
for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Notice how when the apostles were not preaching, Jesus made, made it very clear. They were not preaching a message that came from them. Instead, they were preaching something that came from God. It came from the Holy Spirit. That's where that message came from. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look at verse number 37. Because Paul makes this point clear in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. There Paul says, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things I write to you are what? They are the Lord's commandments, not the commandments of men. These things come from God. That's what Paul is talking about. He says, these things I'm writing, they're coming from the Lord. Now go to Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 11. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 11, Paul says to the churches in Galatia, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what I want you to see is this gospel we're preaching. Gospel preached by the apostles does not originate with me. It originates with God. It comes from God. It comes from His time telling people to repent. Telling people to prepare for the judgment of God when Noah went out and preached that and the people scoffed at that. They refused to obey that message. They were not rejecting Noah personally. Instead, they were rejecting God because Noah was only preaching what God told him. And when Jeremiah went out telling the people that, that hey, you're going to go into 70 years of captivity because of your sins, and the people didn't like that, they got angry about that, when that happened to Jeremiah, they were not rejecting Jeremiah personally. They may have liked him just fine if it wasn't for that preaching. No, they were not rejecting him personally. They were rejecting God because Jeremiah was only preaching what God told him to preach. And when the apostles were beaten and locked up because they preached that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Lord and the Christ, that he had been raised from the dead. And when Stephen was stoned to death because he preached the gospel, when those, kind, those kinds of things happened, the people who heard their preaching were not rejecting them personally. Instead, they were rejecting God. They were rejecting God's word that was being preached by his messengers. You see, that's the truth about the matter, and that's something we got to always remember, my friend. We got to remember that. We got to always remember that as we go out into this community preaching and teaching the word of God, if people reject the things we have to say, they're not rejecting us. They're not rejecting us personally. Instead, they're rejecting God. This is God's message that we're sharing, not our message. This is God's message. And i got to tell you, that, that's something that, that took me a couple of years to finally grasp. i got to tell you, brothers and sisters, for a couple of years, for the first couple of years of, of my preaching, I used to take rejection personally. You ever took rejection personally? I did that. I used to stay up late at night, lose a lot of sleep, because when I taught someone the gospel and they rejected that, I used to think they were rejecting me. That they didn't like me. That maybe I was just not a very adequate teacher. That's the way I used to think for a couple of years. But after praying about this and finally studying what the Bible says about this carefully, I finally began to understand what, what God's will is when it comes to this. I finally began to understand that when people reject the gospel, they're not rejecting me. I didn't write a word in this book. I didn't write one word in this book. When people reject this, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God. You see, God is the one who said in Matthew 19 and verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another commits adultery. You see, I didn't write that verse in the Bible. God put that verse in the Bible. Those are the words of Jesus. That was there long before I came along, and it's going to be long after, here long after I'm gone. And when Jesus says in Mark 16 and verse 16, He who believes is baptized shall be saved. I didn't put that verse in the Bible. Jesus put that verse in the Bible. Those are the words of Jesus. And when Jesus says in John 4 and verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That means we can't just worship God any way we want to. When people reject that, they're rejecting Jesus. 
Because those are his words. Those are not my words. Those are words that come from the Holy Spirit. And so does 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 12, where, where Paul says, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over the man, but to remain quiet. You know what that means? That means that God doesn't want women preachers. And our society today, a lot of people don't like it, but that's what God says. I didn't put that in the Bible. That's the will of God. So I, what I just want you to see is God is the one who revealed all these things we find in Scripture. I want us to understand that this book contains God's will, not our will. This book has been around for a very long time. It's been around long before we even thought of coming into existence, and it's going to be around long after we're gone. And so when people get angry with this message, or flat out reject it, let's always remember, they're not rejecting us personally. Instead, they're rejecting God. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the personal will lined up with, with his will. Verse 48, Charlie alluded in his prayer earlier. Remember in John 12 and verse 48, Jesus says, He who rejects me and has not received my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what would judge him on the last day. Jesus says that rejecting his word is equal to rejecting him. And so let's always remember that. Let's always remember that as we go out teaching the word of God, that when people reject the Word of God, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting us because the Bible comes from God. But a final thing I want to leave you with tonight is this. The third thing we need to remember. When it comes to when it comes to the loss for God, it's our job. Our responsibility. I'll tell you what our responsibility the loss, our responsibility. That goes everything I've ever heard when it comes to this issue. How can you as a preacher say that our responsibility is not to convert people? Well, my friend, the reason I say that is because it's true. It's absolutely true. I want you to think about this as we go to some verses. I want to show you a few verses. Let's start with Mark 16. Look at Mark 16, verse 15. I want you to read these verses with me and see if you can figure out what our responsibility is. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Jesus says this. He said to his people, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. Go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want you to look at verse number 5, please. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 5. Paul says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants whom you have believed even as one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Go now to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. One more verse. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Paul says here, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, in these verses we just read, our responsibility when it comes to evangelism is clearly stated. Do you see it? Notice, according to the Bible, my responsibility, your responsibility is not to convert. Instead, it is to preach. It is to teach the Word of God with a lot of love in our hearts. It is to take the seed, which is the Word of God, and plant it in the hearts of those who need to hear it. According to the Bible, our job is to plant the seed. That's our job, to plant the seed, which is the Word of God. And i got to tell you, that, that can be done in a variety of different ways. For example, it could just start with you introducing the Word of God to your neighbor or your co-worker, in your conversations, you're having it at, at work or, uh, and, or if you are in the backyard talking with them in, in your backyard. It could just start with some simple conversations. You're sprinkling conversations about spiritual things in your daily interactions with these people. And the next thing you know, guess what may happen? The next thing you know, they may be asking you about your faith. They may be asking you about where you go to church. And then the next thing you know, maybe you, now you have an opportunity to sit down at the kitchen table with them and have a real Bible study. Maybe then you have an opportunity to open up the Bible 
and share with them some things pertaining to God's will for them. You see, they have an opportunity to do some real seed plants. The limit of where God wants us to go is to teach. It's to preach. It is to plant the seed. What happens next after that has nothing to do with us. It has to do with God. It has to do with His are planted in their hearts. If they happen to respond to the Word of God, guess who gets glory for that? God does. We don't. I am not a shepherd. That's the power of God unto say. To the positive way after the he can make us allows us to make that when we preach the gospel, the God calls people to go. Jesus as tools God is using. Like Paul said in the first scene, what happens next has to do with God. Through his word in that sense, he'll give the increase. And so as we go out trying to fulfill the Great Commission, can you please remember these things? Can you please remember the devil's trying to constantly use this challenge of rejection? to hinder our efforts to win the loss. Can you please remember that we can overcome this challenge, though, if we remember that this challenge is not a new challenge. The people of God have been dealing with it for a very long time. That the people, when they reject the gospel, they're not really rejecting us. They're rejecting God because the gospel comes from God. And remember, our responsibility, our responsibility is to go out and teach, plant the seed, and let the gospel do its work. Let God give the increase. That's our responsibility. These are things we have to remember to overcome this challenge. And, like, and, and we got to overcome this challenge. we got to overcome this challenge because God has given us a job to do, hasn't he? Let me tell you something. Whether we know it or not, there are a lot of people in this community right now who are lost, who need Jesus. There are a lot of people around us who need to hear the truth of the gospel. And God wants to use us, me and you, together. To plant that gospel in their hearts. And you know what? There are some people out there who will respond to it in a positive way. There are people out there like that. I'm reminded of Titus this morning who came forward and he said, I want to become a Christian. He wanted to get baptized. There are a lot of people like Titus out there. And may God bless Titus. May God bless his young heart who wants to surrender to the gospel. Maybe there's somebody here tonight who has a heart like Titus. Maybe there's someone here tonight who you've been rejecting the gospel for a very long time, but now you're finally ready to submit to the Word of God, believe in Jesus, and become a Christian through baptism and water for forgiveness of sins. Now, we've had one baptism today, but wouldn't it be great to have two or three, maybe four? Maybe there's someone that's ready to do that. That describes you. Then don't wait any longer. Come to the front right now as we're standing there. If you give your heart to Jesus, He will make the white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, do not say.
to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come, come today. Come to Jesus. Dying sinner. Other Savior there is none. He will share. Jesus, come, come today.